Hello, thanks for listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. This is Adam Rosen, your host. I'm a fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in joint replacement. In these episodes, I'm going to share with you a lot of my tips and tricks and review classic articles and current implant designs. Thanks for tuning in and on with the show. Hello, welcome back. This is Adam Rosen. You're listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. On today's episode, um, I was looking back at the topics that I've covered and realized that I haven't covered unis yet. So um, patellofemoral, lateral, medial, I mean, a lot of stuff to cover. I'm just going to cover uh, medial unis and just kind of give you my two cents and my experience Um when I started in practice um, at that point, uh, the preservation uh, was the one that I commonly used. One of the issues that we had back then was the the pin configuration and the way that the pins were set up. There was a risk of tibial plateau fracture. So you kind of modified where the pins are. I haven't used that system in a long time, um, but I'm sure they've probably made a lot of changes to it since 2005. Uh, Then for a while, I was into the Oxford. I really like the Oxford. Um, I do believe they put on a very good course, but you're also drinking a bit of the Kool-Aid. And I think it's nice to see the history and to see some live surgeries and to have a sawbone. So you really walk out of there pretty jazzed. And it's different, you know, than other surgeries, which I think makes it fun. Um, For a while there, uh, especially when I was using a lot of striker triathlon, I was using the PKR. And uh, one of my biggest issues or complaints with that system was the lack of a polyethylene trial. So you put the the trial in, which was the poly, for the composite thickness of the tibial base plate in the poly, but there wasn't an extra poly that if you wanted to put and cement in the tibia and the femur, you couldn't trial a poly or retrial. Um, and I had one instance where as best as I did to get the cement out on post-operative x-rays because you put the real poly and there was some cement behind. So um, DJO, or what's now called a novice, um, they're in power of partial. I used to kind of jokingly call PKR plus um, because if, I, if I'm if i correct, um, Stu Axelson, which was one of the engineers at Stryker, then um, went to DJO, um, was part of that process. And it's a really nice streamlined system um, all in one tray. They do offer polyethylene trials. So you have the ability of actually cementing in the tibia, the femur, putting in a trial, taking the trial out, making sure you haven't left cement, but also confirming what thickness poly you want to put in. Um, and more recently, I've been using the persona, uh, partial, uh, simply because if I was putting in more personas, um, I always hated calling in two different vendors to kind of stand there until I opened up the knee for sure and said, oh, yes, I'm doing a total. Yes, I'm doing a uni. And I've been really happy with the persona partial. I think the instrumentation is very slick. Um, It gives good results, good balancing. So that's just kind of a little um, skinny on my history or sort of experience with those different systems. But more importantly, I think unis are good. Um, I believe there are pro-uni surgeons and sort of not anti-uni surgeons, but not super pro-uni surgeons, meaning that you'll meet some surgeons who do tons of unis and you're thinking, what gives? Why are they doing so many unis compared to the other guy or other gal? Um, And I think for one reason, there might be a surgeon in your area that gets referred all of the unis. So they're going to get a ton of unis. I remember Jess Lahner in Philly. It wasn't that he saw so many people with patellofemoral arthritis that he did that many patellofemorals. It's just that everybody in town, if they had a patient they thought was a candidate for patellofemorals, tended to send that patient to him. Um, but you also have docs that are you know, into the uni. Um, and I think sometimes you see docs that sort of push the percentages and they may wind up with some more unhappy patients that need a revision. On the flip side, you have doctors that are more conservative, that probably do totals in patients that may otherwise have been happy with a uni and may not be happy with their total. So it's that fine balance for you as an individual of trying to decipher from x-rays and exams and patient expectations and your skills as to what is going to be best for the patient that you're caring for. Um, One of the simple things that I do, because sometimes you'll have patients that you know are not a candidate for a partial, um, but they will ask about it. And um, for me, 
um, I'm a believer in patellofemoral symptoms, not just on chondral malaysia. So the Oxford guys will tell you, they kind of disregard the patellofemoral joint. Um, but also in certain studies and in certain countries that if you have a surgeon that does good unis, um, or you have a country or surgeon that it's near impossible to get back into, a patient may accept some pain or discomfort. Where in America, especially you have a lot more docs and a lot more options and a lot more access, if you have a patient that has a partial that still has some symptoms, they're going to find somebody. And if they have something that they can offer that patient surgically, they're going to offer it. Um, whereas if you have a uni and, you know, the doc is the only doc in town and he tells you there's, there's nothing to do, it looks fine, or you can't get back into your um, managed healthcare system for four years, you're probably just going to learn to live with it. But for me, I like to do a, a patellar grind test and someone jumps off the table and I feel bad that I caused them pain. Um, but also I say that won't go away if we do a partial. And if you have a lot of anterior knee pain, pain with stairs, pain with hills, you know, that's a patient with patellofemoral changes that in my hands, I'm recommending a total. Whereas if I have a patient, even with mild changes on x-ray, but asymptomatic in the patellofemoral joint, no reproducible crepitations, no complaints of anterior pain with stair climbing and things like that, even though they have, may have some chondral malaysia, um, I will not do the uni. I'll do a denervation. If they have any osteophytes, I'll remove that. Um, but I'm going with the uni. Now, the next most important thing that I really stress, especially to younger surgeons, and especially if that's most of you that are listening, is if you don't do a surgery all the time and you're not super technically skilled at it, don't cheat the patient by trying to do it through a smaller incision. I think this is one of the bigger mistakes I see. I remember when list plating came out and people that hadn't done list plating and weren't traumatologists thought, well, I can do all this through a small incision because I don't have to see the fracture, but they didn't reduce it and it failed. And it wasn't a failure of the implant system. It was a failure of the surgical technique. So if you're not used to doing unis and you do this through a really small incision, I see people struggle and I see that cutting guides get jimmied because the soft tissue space is small, the skin's pushing on the jigs or the instruments or your retractors or you can't see, and you wind up with a inferior outcome. So for me, my incisions, I mean, you always hear me talk about, you know, uh, two fingers above the patella, three fingers below for most of my patients. And if I'm doing a uni, it's like one above and two below, or, you know, depending on where the tibia is in relation to the patella, it might be right to the top of the patella and three below, but it's not terribly smaller. And if I can't see, if it's a muscular guy, I extend the incision. I don't try to struggle just to make the length of the skin incision smaller because I want to make sure that the outcome is as best as possible because that's that's the issue people run into. So I think for starters, you have to have a good algorithm as to which patient you're going to offer a uni and what decisions you're going to make both before surgery and at the time of surgery as to what surgery is going to be best for the patients. I always tell my patients, when I open up your knee, if we're not sure, when I open up your knee, I will do for you what I would do for my own knee if I was doing my own surgery. And that gives them a lot of comfort in the decision-making process. Um, the next most important thing I think is, you know, again, after your exposure is making your tibial cut. And templating is important because, you know, if you're using an extramedullary guide and you're not really sure where the center of the ankle is or the tibial spine, if you template out, you know, a nice semi-flat rectangular cut um, and your cut looks asymmetric, stop and ask yourself why was your jig off you know is your alignment off don't just assume that you use this extra medullary alignment guide cut your tibia you cut this weird wedge you left them in varus or valgus and now you just move on so make sure that your tibia cut is what it should be not just the thickness but you want to make sure that your alignment is appropriate and then probably the next most common um, thing that i see in my clinic as far as failed unis for second opinions um is the alignment of the femur to the tibia. A lot of these systems now are set up where they mate, you know, one component off of the other. So if you're trying to rush, you know, and maybe you over lateralize, you know, into the notch. So maybe you were afraid your size that you thought was going to overhang. So you shifted the whole tibia medial, but then you couldn't see and you wound up moving your femur too far, or rather you move your tibia to our lateral and you move your femur too far medial the condylar surface of the femur is not mating up against the poly. And I even saw this with some people that used unis where, you know, they were taught, oh, it's a sphere, it's a ball and socket, but you still have to go through those steps of lining everything up. So when you're doing your tibia and then doing your femur, you know, really take the time to make sure that the alignment lines itself up and that you wind up with a good result and a good outcome. And if you struggle, 
you know, if you plan to do a uni, the patient looks like a good uni candidate, and you're doing a uni and something's off and you can't balance it, even though you've made your tibial femoral cuts and the balancing's just off and you can't figure out why, you may have to even bail at that point to a total. So be ready to go backwards. Um, Now, at the end, the reason I do like unis, um, and I always kind of tell patients this, and, and when I teach, I talk about this, is, you know, I think if you blindfolded, you know, an experienced surgeon, that we could pick up a knee and you could feel what a normal knee feels like and what an arthritic knee feels like. You know, there's a certain feel, a certain sound, a certain laxity or tightness, and you could feel, oh, this is normal. This is an arthritic knee. And if you picked up a total knee, you'd still have that feel. You'd feel the sound or the noise or the laxity or the clicking of some sort. It just, it feels mechanical. And that's where I always describe to patients, like a normal knee is at best at a 10 and a great total knee is at best an eight, where I always say a uni is more like a nine. Um, so I think a uni just feels more kinematically normal and a really good uni. Sometimes it would be hard to tell the difference between, you know, a uni and a normal knee if it's really balanced well. And I just find the patients are happier. So if I have a patient with a uni on one side and a total on the other, they will almost always tell me, yeah, the uni feels more like my normal knee. Well, yeah, we only replaced one third. All the ligaments are still there. It's kinematically closer to normal where the total knee is just different. You know, it's better than the arthritic knee, but it's nowhere like a normal knee and it's not like a uni. Um... And then just to confuse things down the road, the question, and I don't know what the answer is to it, I haven't done this personally, but I know people that do it. Let's say you do a medial uni, they love it, and it's fine, but now they develop lateral arthritis. Do you convert to a total, or do you throw in a lateral uni? I don't know. Um, But just I figured kind of my two cents, um, the last topic was uh, sort of... um, you know, a deep, introspective, personal topic that um, I wanted to cover, and I didn't feel that I could just kind of end on that, um, but I'm going to take a break for a while. So um, this is going to be my last episode for a while. Um, I hope all of you like it. You know, my goal in the beginning was really to kind of cover s- season one, which is I wanted to go through my brain um, from beginning to end of knee patients, knee arthritis, and knee replacement. Um, and I've done a lot more than that. So I hope you like it. If you do enjoy this, um, please take the time, um, go leave a review, uh, leave your five stars, leave your comments, leave your pros and cons. Uh, feel free to criticize if there's things that you don't like. And if there's topics that you would like me to cover when I come back, um, shoot me a message, leave it in the comments. Um, I'll make it a point to go back and kind of look at those comments uh, when I log back on. But uh, in the meantime, continue to keep taking care of yourself, keep taking care of your patients, keep reading and studying, stay healthy, stay active, stay safe. And for the meantime, I'm going to be signing off. This is Adam Rosen. You've been listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. You've been listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. Make sure that you're subscribed so you'll be notified of future episodes. And please take the time to leave a review. It helps other people like you find the show. Until next time, stay safe.